I'd like to, um, to start by doing a, a little bit of a, a, a trip into the past to what Java looked like when I started my development career. Um, ah, that's a little bit too far back. Um, <laughs> I've been developing for a long time, but not quite that long time. But certainly by, by 2005, I'd been a developer for a few years, and there was a way things were, and there was a way that everybody knew things had to be. And there was no such thing as the cloud. We ran everything on premises. We ran everything on, on dedicated hardware. And we were running on application servers. And these application servers lived for a very long time. It wasn't unusual for these servers to be up for six months. And they were multi-tenant. They were running with huge heaps. And gradually, our industry started changing. And we started realizing that maybe these things that take a really long time to start up and these applications that take a really long time to deploy aren't so great. And so in 2015, I was working for a, a previous employer, and we'd just come up with a new application server that was so light and delightful compared to, to what had come before. And so I wrote a little blog article, because I was one of the engineers on it, and I was really proud, and I said, that it used to be, and it was quite true, that on the old application server, if you were going to go deploy your application, it would take so long, it would take many minutes, you had plenty of time to go make yourself a cup of tea, which was really annoying, as you can imagine. Every time you wanted to test, you had to get tea. I mean, <laughs> we were turning into tea by the end of the day. Um, I got into a little bit of trouble for that article. Um, I was told that it was fine to say nice things about the new product, but I wasn't to say bad things about the old product or make unfavorable tea-related analogies, please. So, a lesson learned. But think, time passes, um, and a year ago, I moved and I joined Red Hat. I'm an engineer on the Quarkus team. I help build Quarkus. Um, so that, of course, should give you some idea that, that what I will be presenting to you will not necessarily be a neutral view. I help build Quarkus. I have a bias. But I have to say, I feel really lucky to work on the Quarkus team. I feel really lucky to work on a product like Quarkus. So why, why is Quarkus? Well, I've talked a little bit about how things were, but let me talk about some of the things that changed. And the first one was, in 2011, our industry started talking about microservices. What if instead of having one big application, we split it up into smaller chunks and deployed those smaller chunks, each one on a virtual machine? That sounded kind of OK. But then what really changed our industry was in 2013, Docker arrived. And Docker allowed us to have these really lightweight deployment units. And of course, the thing about containers, they're, they're a bit like M&Ms or Smarties or something. You never have just one container. You always have a lot of containers. And so this really accelerated the move of Java to the cloud. Well, I say it really accelerated the move of Java to the cloud, but actually, I think it took Java a really long time to adapt to the cloud. And I'm not sure Java actually has adapted to the cloud yet. And you know, as Sven mentioned in, in the beginning, if you compare Java, our favorite runtime, and Java seems really great until you kind of look across the fence and you look at how our Go colleagues are able to deploy a lot of Go instances onto a single machine. And then you look at our JavaScript colleagues. And first of all, you laugh at them, because as Java developers, that's what we do. We say, silly people, look at you in your silly runtime. Wait a minute, why, why is your deployment density better than my deployment density when I am a Java developer? So it's a little bit embarrassing. And then we look at Java, and we get a bit depressed, because Java has this big heap, and then it has this big footprint. And we can only deploy a few Java instances. 
And this actually matters. It matters a lot in the cloud, where it costs money, but it also matters for us on our laptops. About a year ago, the, my colleagues in Red Hat Consulting, they got an email from someone, and he was the CTO of a fintech. And they had this microservices stack, and because he was the CTO, they'd issued him with like a top-of-the-line MacBook, and it had, you know, it was an M1, and it had 64 gig of RAM. And when he would try and bring up his tech stack on this laptop, it would start smoking, and it would barely come up. And he thought, this, this isn't right. This, we shouldn't be developing our applications in such a way that because we're doing microservices, we can't actually develop anymore. So a lot of that is about the deployment density. But there's another problem with Java applications in the cloud, which is that in the cloud, what do we do with our applications? We do not leave them running for six months. We stop them, we start them, we stop them, we start them. We stop them and start them a lot. And I sometimes talk about light switch ops, which is how we should be architecting our applications to tolerate being turned off and on, which is partly about resiliency, but it's also about speed. Because historically, Java applications are not at all like a light switch. You, you cannot turn that thing off and turn it on again unless you have a decent amount of time. so far, up to now. So then the question is, well, we've got, we've got some really clever engineers in the Java space. Clearly, we are better than the JavaScript engineers. Can we, as an industry, can we, can we do better than that? And this, of course, is where Quarkus comes in. So just to sort of cut, cut to the end a little bit, what we see with Quarkus is we are able to get a deployment density that's maybe not quite as good as Go, but it is much better than we used to do, much, much better than we used to do. And importantly, it's much better than we get with Node.js as well. So we, don't, we can feel smug again as Java developers. Um, but just to sort of focus in on the, on the bit that, that's probably most relevant for us, we did a lot better. So a traditional cloud native stack, like we've been using for a while, when you compare it to some, the same code running on Quarkus, the deployment density is much higher. And if you go and you deploy it on Quarkus native, which uses GraalVM under the covers, which is absolutely amazing technology, your deployment density is ridiculously high. So what is Quarkus? Uh, Quarkus is an open source stack for writing Java applications. In terms of the programming model and the libraries, it's, it's integrated with the libraries that people are using most often. So we've got, um, in general, we support MicroProfile, and that's the programming model. Uh, we've got a Hibernate integration, and in fact, we, we sit quite closely and we share some people with the, the Hibernate team, because a lot of them work for Red Hat. So we have a very deep Hibernate integration. We've got a deep CDI integration. We've got integrations for most of the, the programming models that you probably want to be doing. And as well, part of my job is to look at our integration ecosystem. So if we're missing an integration, please come tell me. I'd love to know about it. So how does, how does Quarkus adapt to the cloud? What, what, what's better about it? Well, I think you probably already know. Quarkus applications start much faster. So compared to your traditional cloud native stack, we're starting in about a quarter of the time if you run Quarkus on JVM, or in about a fifth, five percent of the time, very, very fast <laughs> if, you, if you run it as a, a natively compiled binary um, running on GraalVM. So let me just show this um, because it is cool. So if I go to my terminal, And if I run my application, 
you can see there, it started in 20 milliseconds. And it's actually, in some ways, it's incredibly cool. And in other ways, it starts faster than you can see. Um, so you don't really appreciate quite how fast it's starting. But there it is again. There it is again. Um, when I first, when I compiled my first application to native, I did exactly that for about five minutes, just kind of stopping it and starting it because it was so, it was so exciting. Um, and as well, just to, just to prove that I actually have an application here rather than just an echo statement that I've <laughs> that I've put with um, with a shell script. Uh, let me start that again, and let me go to a browser. And if I do localhost 8080 slash hello, and then let's say Fred. There we go. Hello, Fred. And just to be like extra, extra convincing you that there wasn't any tricks involved, if I go back, if I reload that, it's gone. So. So what, what I'd done there is that there was two steps to that demo. Um, the second one was to start the native executable. The first one was to run a native build, which is just adding a, a minus p native flag. You'll notice I didn't show you that bit. That's because compiling to native is slow. Um, so that simple application takes about a minute to compile to native. You're obviously not going to want to be doing that as part of your Every everyday development flow, and you also definitely want to, don't want to do it as a live demo because the way of live demos is that everything takes 18 times as long, so it's an eternity. I mentioned um, that you can't actually really see how fast Quarkus is starting. I, I did some. Uh, I'm not sure you probably can't read that very well, um, but let me. Let me talk you through. I did some benchmarking against a light bulb. And when I say benchmarking, I mean I looked at our published numbers and I looked at the published numbers for various light bulbs. Um, we all know if you have one of those old style fluorescent light bulbs that were the first thing we used to replace our incandescent light bulbs, they take forever to start. So that takes way longer than any Java application to start. Um, if you're looking at your traditional cloud native stack, um, you're, you're faster than a fluorescent light bulb. If you are running Quarkus on JVM, we're, we're a lot faster than the, the traditional stack. Now, here's when it gets interesting. An LED light bulb is starting in about, about 20 milliseconds, so faster than Quarkus on JVM. But you'll notice these lines here that you cannot see. Those are because of the scale of the fluorescent light bulb. So Quarkus on JVM is starting faster than a light bulb, which is why you can't see it as well. You can't actually see it happening when I show it. So then the next question is, well, OK, that's, that's a nice party trick. But the main thing my application does is not start and stop. Does, does the startup time actually matter? Sometimes, yes. Um, so if you're running serverless, obviously, startup time matters a lot. As well, what we find is for some some organizations, they want to, they're not necessarily using serverless, but they're using auto-scaling. And so if they have a bursty load, they get much better resiliency if the application, is, if the auto-scaler can respond to a surge quickly rather than having to, to wait many seconds for something to come up. So then the next thing to talk about is footprint. Um, so again, I think you've probably all seen these kinds of numbers that with your traditional cloud native stack, your footprint is large. It's about half with Quarkus, and it's about 10% if you're running Quarkus on, on the, um, as a Graal VM. And again, this, this starts to matter more. This matters a lot in the cloud because it has a financial impact. And, and we see some other sort of impacts. So a couple of years ago, I, I was told this story um, one of the project managers working on Quarkus was at a conference, and they were a project manager. They weren't necessarily the most technical member of the team, and so they were demoing Quarkus. So someone would come up and they'd demo Quarkus, and then the next person would come up and they'd demo Quarkus. And they, this kept going until the end of the day when they looked at their machine, and they realized that every time someone came up to them, they'd 
started Quarkus, and they had never actually thought to stop Quarkus. And so they had 120 instances of Quarkus running on their laptop. And the cool thing is that they didn't notice. They would have never noticed until they sort of saw their process listing and went, wow, that's, that's a lot. And you know, I mentioned that the, the, the biggest impact of the memory footprint is the financial one. Because if you have a dedicated instance, you don't really care what your footprint is. If you're running in the cloud, you're paying, you know, there's quite fine-grained choices about what instance size you have. So you can go to a smaller instance, you can save money. So we talk a lot. If you visit the Quarkus homepage, you can see stuff about the footprint, you can see stuff about the, the, um, the startup time. One thing we talk less about, and we don't have it on the homepage, and I really wish we did, is throughput. Quarkus, as well, has higher throughput. Um, so we, these are numbers from our performance lab. Um, we saw if you're running Quarkus native, you get like on, at 48 concurrent connections. Quarkus native gives you 3,000 requests per second. That is less than you would get with traditional cloud native. There is a throughput hit for running native. Um, these numbers aren't running with the newest version of GraalVM. GraalVM 23 have some pretty amazing performance metrics with, where they're saying that their throughput is only about 2% lower than it would be running on the JVM. We haven't run those in our lab yet to confirm. But then you can see that with Quarkus, the throughput is way higher. So that's kind of um, amazing. But we see this you know, when, when people try Quarkus out, they sort of see the same thing. So here you know, we've got the request per second, um, with Quarkus, we've got 9,000 requests per second. With Spring Boot, 7,000 requests per second. So again, you can see there's that, that improvement in throughput with Quarkus. And then as well, on the right-hand side, you've got the, the lower throughput with, um, with Spring. And again, this one came out recently, and they had sort of, whoa. Sorry, that was um, <laughs> not, not the most readable one. Um, but What's noticeable is that they had improved, significantly improved response times with Quarkus and also significantly improved throughput. And the response time actually matters as well, because throughput, again, may be one of those metrics that you can't necessarily tie it to a business result, but response time, you, you can. So Akamai did some research a while ago, and they found that if they had something like a 10% drop in response, worsening in response time, that was a 7% drop in conversion. So users get annoyed if the response time is poor. So, so far this sounds kind of miraculous, right? Like, we've got the better startup time, we've got the better footprint, we've got the better throughput, and, and you kind of think that, that seems like it's sort of something for nothing, right? What, what are we giving up? And I think this is certainly, I have a, I have a performance background, and the, the rule of performance in general is that you very rarely actually improve performance. Instead, you just trade off one thing against another. You're doing optimizations where we say, okay, well, let's optimize for this environment. Occasionally, in performance, you can eliminate waste. And so you can see that with these numbers, right? Like with Quarkus Native against Quarkus on JVM, there's clearly a trade-off. You can choose your fast startup time or you can choose your throughput. You have to make that choice. But when you're looking at, on the JVM, Quarkus against your, your traditional stack, there, there is no trade-off. It is just better. So how, how does that happen? How do we get something for nothing? And again, I think this comes back to looking at some of the, the history of computing, which is that we used to write our application servers so that you could have a whole bunch of applications sharing a single instance. You, that application would be redeployed many, many times. So we used to have the sort of, what we used to try and achieve is the model where you could be like flying the plane and changing the engine and then swapping out the wings and everything would still work. And we would also, a lot of times, we'd, we'd be able to change the application dependencies while the application was running. That was really cool. It was really clever engineering. Everything that we did was optimized to allow these applications to be dynamic. But of course, dynamism has a cost. You, there is an overhead to dynamism, and you're paying sort of a, a tax for dynamism. 
And now, we're running in containers. Now, if you want to redeploy your application, you would not patch your container. Instead, you would throw that container out and make a new one. At least, I hope if you want to change your application in a container, you would not patch your container. If you're still patching your containers, please come talk to me afterwards, and we can have a larger conversation. But in general, cloud apps, they are immutable. And so then if we take these old frameworks that were designed to be incredibly dynamic and run them in a container, it is pointless. Actually, it's worse than pointless because we're doing, we have all this waste, so we're like loading all these classes that aren't needed, and we're doing all of this reflection. Reflection is really expensive, it's really slow. And then we do all this initialization at runtime because our environment might have changed. Our environment has not changed. Our dependencies have not changed. We are in a container. And so in general, how, how frameworks start is that they do a tiny amount of stuff at build time. Basically, it is just the packaging of getting the stuff into the jar, and then the build time work is done. Everything else happens at runtime, and there is a lot of it. So there's parsing config files, there's reading all the YAML, um, then there's like class path scanning, then we try and load the classes to see if they're there, and then maybe we enable or disable features based on what classes are there. And then we keep going, and then eventually once we've done all that, then maybe we can build a, a meta model of the world so that we can try and decide how to behave. And then finally, at the very end, we do things like starting thread pools, IO, that kind of thing. So the insight that the Quarkus team had was, hey, we could do this at build time. It would be a lot better if we did it at build time. So all of that stuff, like looking at what's on the class path, reading the YAML, is done at build time instead. And only a tiny, tiny fraction of the work is done at runtime. And for this to work, of course, you have, to, you have to give something up. What you give up is the dynamism. What you give up is the ability to swap your application dependencies out at runtime. So in Quarkus, we talk about a closed world assumption, which is what you build with is what you will have at runtime. And doing all of this work up front at build time enables much better runtime behavior performance, that kind of thing, when you're running on the JVM. But of course, the other thing that enables, which a lot of people know Quarkus for, is being able to run on GraalVM or use GraalVM to get a native binary. And I think it's just a really nice thing that what you needed to do to work with GraalVM also happens to make life better, even if you never go anywhere near GraalVM and even if you just run as a Java application. So this is often where we get to sort of the end of, of what people, people know about Quarkus. I did a master class yesterday, but I also did one at Go to Aarhus. And at pretty much the end of the day, one of the people in the master class said to me, so Holly, if, if I've understood you correctly, the, the main thing about Quarkus is that the performance is better. Is that right? And I was so depressed because I, I sort of jumped up and down and said, no, that the performance is cool. But that is not the only thing about Quarkus, so I, I probably scared him a little bit. But one of the things that we really work hard on in Quarkus is what we call developer joy. So this is trying to get the developer experience as amazing as possible. And this is something that often we see people will sort of come to Quarkus for the performance and then stay for the developer experience because developers love coding with Quarkus. And all of that work that we were doing to get things done at build time, as well as enabling better performance, it enables a better developer experience because we know how your application works. We know what your dependencies are. And so we can make some assumptions. We can have some opinions and stuff just works without you having to tell us about it because we've seen your application. We know how it's supposed to work. So let me, let me show you what some of that looks like. So the first thing that I'm going to do 
is I'm going to go to, let me, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this bigger. I'll do that in a moment. I'm going to go to code.quarkus.io. So this is the best place to get started with a Quarkus application. You can download a scaffolding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, you, and you can see some of these have starter code. So, so if I download this one, I will get a complete application. So I'll do that. I'll generate my application. Let's download the zip. Now, if I... <laughs> if I find this thing that has just downloaded, that has downloaded to completely the wrong place, If I take that, and then let's just open it in my IDE. So you can see in my starter code, there's a few interesting things. One is this Docker folder. So Quarkus was designed to be a container-native runtime. It's designed to be a Kubernetes runtime, and that means containers. So when you, do, when you create a Quarkus application, you get a bunch of Docker files. This is actually something that I think the, um, the Quarkus team regrets slightly now, because the nature of Docker files is that they're static. And so we define things like a base image. And what we're seeing now that Quarkus has been in the field for a while is we visit our customers and we look at their Docker file, and it is the same Docker file we gave them three years ago. We really would have liked them to update their base image. And it's kind of, because it's such a static file, it's hard to do that. And things like the ports tend to not get updated. So it's much better, what we now recommend people do, and we've got um, helpers for it, is to use a tool called Jib to generate the images. So that's a Java-based image builder. So we can generate your image based on what's actually in your application instead of what might have been in your application when you generated it three years ago. So, the only other thing that I've got in my application is a REST endpoint that gives me a greeting. So let's, let's start this. So if I do Maven, Quarkus, Dev, I can start that. And I'm going to click R, and that's going to enable continuous testing. So it's going to run my tests every time the code changes. So you can see my test is passing, which is reassuring because I just downloaded it. Um, and so now I can go here and I can see my application. And then if I go here, I can change that. So I can do hello go to, I can save it. And we should see my test has failed because it knows that I changed the code and that this, there's a relationship between this code and this test because it uses like a reverse code coverage technique. So if I go to my, oops. Uh, I love the, I, the IntelliJ shortcut to open tests, except that I do not have the muscle memory for it and I can never do it properly. So um, if I go here and if I do contain string, and if I just say hello, I can lazily get my test passing. So again, you can see the, the live coding. And this is something that the Quarkus team kind of had to do. Because we're doing so much compilation up front and so much at build time, if we, had, if we did things just sort of the, the normal way and did all of that stuff as a compile cycle, it would be really annoying to develop with. So we had to develop all of the live reload and the hot reload because we're doing more at build time, so we had to be smarter about it. So if I go back here, and if I add in a query param, and if I say that's name, and then if I say that's name, um, string name, then I should be able to do and save that, and then you can see I was generic enough with my tests that my tests are still passing. Um, so now if I do this, 
name equals Holly, and it works. Cool. So, but so far, this is pretty simple, right? This is just a REST endpoint. Can we do something more interesting? So I'm going to add persistence to my application. So if I do, there's a Quarkus CLI. Almost everything you can do in the Quarkus CLI, you can just do with Maven commands. But the Quarkus CLI has slightly less typing. So if I do, actually, let me see if I got it in. Yeah. So I'm going to add in Hibernate. And I'm going to add in a JDBC Postgres driver. And so if I add that in, then what I should be able to do is make an entity. So let's make a new class. And let's call it greeting. And I'm going to annotate it with an entity. So, so far, so familiar. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this extends a panache entity. So panache is quite a fundamental programming model in Quarkus. It's a layer on top of Hibernate that it does similar things to Spring Data if you're, if you're used to that. So it enables a repository pattern without a bunch of boilerplate. And it also enables an active record pattern, which I really like. So if I have a string name, then that should be enough for my entity to work. So now if I go back here, and if I say, um, I format that? No. So when, when my request comes in, I'm going to make a greeting. And I'm going to set the greeting name to the name that came in. And then I'm going to call greeting persist. So this, you can see, is the active record pattern, that instead of having to have a data access object, my greeting is doing it all. Because I'm writing to the database, I better add a transactional annotation. Now, if I try this, let's see. So if I run that, yeah, that's cool. Now, you may be noticing that something is missing, which is that I claim to be writing to the database, and I didn't do anything to actually configure a database. And so this is where a really cool Quarkus feature called test containers comes in. So if I look here, oh dear, have I got two Quarkuses running? No, I haven't. Um, so if I, so I'm using Podman, similar to Docker. Um, you can see I have a database. And so if I stop that, if I go back here, I get an error, because I have just stopped the database that Quarkus is using. If I now stop and start Quarkus, Normally, you don't need to stop and start Quarkus. It will do almost everything. Things like taking the database out from under Quarkus, it does get a little bit upset by. Now, if I go back here, you can see it's working. And if I go back and look at Podman PS again, I've got a database. So what it's done is it said, well, you're running in development mode. This is not in production. You are trying to use a database. You do not have a database configured. I'll be helpful. I'll use test containers to spin up a database. So this can be used for things like the unit tests, and it also can be used just when run, running manually to verify it. But of course, we don't. Act, I'm saying, look, I'm persisting things to a database. We have no evidence that anything is in a database. Um, so let's let's have a peek at what's in our database. So let's add another method. Um, let's give it a get, and let's give it a path of, let's call it names, and then let's say, and actually let's, yeah, let's just copy all that because typing is hard. So let's make a new method called names. 
And what we're going to do here is we're going to do another bit from the active record pattern, which is I'm going to call a static method on my greeting, which is list all. And that should give me a list of greetings. And then, oh, okay. So I've got my list of greeting called greetings. And then I'm going to say my string, string equals, now I'm going to have to look this up because it is a stream thing and I cannot type that. So if I do, Greetings dot stream dot map. And so I'm just going to get the name of my greeting so that I can do it as a string. And then I'm going to collect it and I'm going to just join it with a comma. And then if I just return something that says something like I've seen. Let's call that names. If I call it, I've seen names. Now, if we go here, if I do hello slash names, then we don't have any names. But if I go back here, and if I put in, I visit it as Holly again, if I go back here, it says, I've seen Holly. So why didn't it have any names the first time? It was because I was making changes to the application, and so it was dropping and recreating my database for me because it assumes that when it live reloads, I probably want it to drop and recreate the database on changes because otherwise the schema might not work. So again, I could do Fred here, then I've got Fred, and then if I go here, we've got Holly and Fred. So you can see I have genuine persistence um, with, with very little effort. So the final thing I can do is that what if I don't want my database to be blank when I start? I can create some initialization scripts. So if I go here, and if I make a new file, and I call it import.sql. And so again, this is a, a convention over configuration thing, which is that I don't have to configure it to say my import script is called import SQL. It just says import SQL is a really sensible name for an import script. Let's use that. Um, and so now, again, I'm going to have to read the SQL because I do not type SQL very often. But what I can do is I can do insert into greeting, ID, name, and then I can do values. Uh, let's do one and Alice, and let's just check and see if that worked. So, <laughs> nope, that didn't work. What did I do? Oh, semicolons. So if we try that, we've got Alice. And so again, I could make this a little bit more detailed. So I can put in Bob2. And we've got Alice and Bob. And then I can come back and visit our old Fred, friend Fred. Oh, I've been careless with my keys. So let me... Let me just try and make sure that these are a bit more unique. So if I do that, then let's try that. Yep, so we've got Fred, but not Alice and Bob. So what we need to do here is we need to do next val greeting sec. And then hopefully if we do that here as well, Then, no, I think, 
Oh, was someone? Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> It is incredible. Something about doing a live demo is that every brain cell just leaks away. So let's, let's try this. Okay, we've got, thank you very much. <laughs> you, you have rescued me. <laughs> um, so I think on that note, I think this is a good time to, uh, to stop with the live coding. And, um, and let's see. So, um, I've got a few slides just reiterating what I did in case it all failed or in case you want to look at the slides afterwards. Um, but I'm going to skip over them because I think we've seen them all. So we've seen the continuous testing. If you have a big application and it ran every test, that would be annoying. It uses like a reverse code coverage technique to only run the tests that are affected by the code that you changed. Um, there is a developer UI, which I didn't show. It's quite cool. Again, this is something that I take for granted. And then when I do the workshop, people say, wow, we don't have that in Spring. That's really cool. Oh, OK, cool. Um, the test containers, there is absolutely no config. Um, whereas if, if you do it some other ways, then often it does end up having manual config. None of that is needed. If, if you configure it, you will not have test containers. It will use your real database. If you do not configure it, you will have test containers. Again, you don't even need to set the, the drop and re recreate. So the only thing you need for it to work is to not do anything, which is a little bit counterintuitive. I think that's something that sometimes people, when they learn Quarkus, they have to unlearn things, because you assume you have to do something. And the key is to not do anything. Of course, in production, you probably don't want to run with test containers in production. It actually wouldn't let you. Um, so you can use a profile to say, normally I don't want a database. In production, please give me a database. And in production, let's, let's use validate for our, our, test, for our um, schema generation. And we've got, we've got um, dev, we call these dev services. We've got dev services for all of the databases, for things like Keycloak, Elasticsearch, Redis, Kubernetes as well, which is quite cool. So you can be coding against Kubernetes, and it will, use kind, it will spin up kind under the covers so that you don't have to have an actual Kubernetes. And in general, the, the Quarkus philosophy is very much about being opinionated so that you don't have to have as much boilerplate. So again, you don't need that sort of boilerplate to declare an application. Um, with Hibernate, you could use the repository pattern um, and just have that. But alternatively, I quite like to just get rid of the DAO entirely and just have the ac active record pattern instead. But then the question is, OK, that's nice, but <laughs> lots of people are using Spring. Um, how do I get from Spring to Quarkus? There's a couple of things that you can do. One is we have a set of Spring compatibility libraries. Um, my colleague has a real, really cool demo where what he does is he just goes into the palm.xml, uh, removes the Spring dependencies, adds the Quarkus Spring compatibility libraries, doesn't change any code, and the application works, except it runs twice as fast, which is cool. Um, on the tests, you do have to change things. The, the testing architecture is a bit different, but for the actual application, you don't have to. Alternatively, um, there's migration toolkit, so you've got a few options there, like wind up or whatever. And we do find that people are able to get going with Quarkus really quite quickly. So Decathlon recently started using it, and their tech lead said within a week, I was, I was where I was. I mentioned Quarkus is open source. Um, every release, we do a t-shirt. They are, they are prized items, um, it's a, that t-shirt, this t-shirt. There's about 600 contributors who got a t-shirt for the last release. So there is a lot of com contributors from a lot of different organizations. But I've left, perhaps, the most important thing to the end, um, because we, can, we always knew Quarkus was fast, but we didn't really know, well, just because you're fast, does, does that make you greener? Um, so we did, we did the experiments. We did experiments in a couple of ways. You can measure it on the processor using a tool called REPL, but that only works if you actually have access to the processor. Um, and in general, if you're in the cloud, the joy of the cloud is it is a black box. You do not have access to the processor. Um, so in that case, you can infer from your load using some data sets, and you can get a carbon footprint. 
So we did a set of experiments that ran a workload over 20 days, so it was a realistic experiment, not just a microbenchmark. And we were able to see that with Quarkus on both native and JVM, you could run on a much smaller instance. And converting that to the carbon measurements, it meant that the carbon footprint was about half with Quarkus. Now that's just based on interpolation and a, and a data set. Um, so the other thing that we did was we did it in our performance lab and we used the Intel instrumentation to actually get the energy usage, which again, you can then turn into a carbon usage. And you can see on this graph, lower is better. Quarkus on JVM has the lowest carbon footprint, which surprised us. We thought it would be Quarkus on native, but actually because the throughput is faster, the carbon is lower. And then again, you can see that you know, your, your traditional legacy framework has a much higher throughput. Um, so yeah, Quarkus actually does reduce footprint, carbon footprint. It doesn't just look like it does. And then the final question we often get is, OK, this is really nice, but Quarkus is new. Well, actually, it's not that new. It's about three or four years old now. Is anyone using it in production? Yeah, so we've got, we've got a bunch of user stories on our website, but there's a couple that I wanted to pick out. Um, Lufthansa are using it, uh, not, not for the planes, um, for one of their back-end systems. Um, but they, they had microservices that they couldn't actually afford to run anymore, and so they switched to, to Quarkus, and the footprint went tiny. And, and Vodafone Greece as well, they, they were one of our first production users because they had an application that wasn't stable. So they started using us before we even hit version one. And they switched from Spring to Quarkus in two days and are in production and have ridiculously good performance numbers. But they also find that they're much more productive than they were before, which is kind of awesome. So to wrap up, definitely, Quarkus, that deployment density does lower your cost. It also lowers your carbon footprint, which is awesome. But don't forget about the developer experience, the dev services, the live reload, the developer UI. I think all of those add to something that is hopefully quite nice to use. <laughs>